Massive disclaimer. I suck at this game. Okie dokie, so today's ancient DOS game is Albion, and this one's been pretty highly requested for reasons which will become apparent pretty quickly, but I really need to stress that I just can't play this thing. Well, I mean, yeah, I'm playing it now on screen, but what it means is that this is not a game which resonates with me in the slightest. I tried looking up walkthroughs, reading the entire manual twice, but after a dozen hours of gameplay, the furthest I was able to get was about halfway through the first major dungeon in the game. I never even got up to the point of getting my fourth party member, and you can have up to six of them at a time. So, this is kind of awkward, having to talk about a game which I barely made any progress in, but I was playing it long enough to get an idea of how most of it works, so even though I won't be able to comment on the progression of the game or any later mechanics like spellcasting, I'll still be able to talk about the basics and some of the design choices which become apparent early in. The gist of it though is that Albion is huge. This is an underrated classic through and through. Few people talk about it anymore despite having some incredible incredibly well done graphics, a very deep storyline with numerous characters to talk to, multiple layers of game mechanics, tons of items to find and utilize. This is a game you can get lost in for countless hours, so it's no surprise that many of those who've played it absolutely love it. However, all of that said, I do have a few theories as to why this game is as forgotten as it is despite how well done it is, and I'll go into those as the details become pertinent. But I will say right now that even though this isn't really a game I personally would want to play more of, I did enjoy what little of it I was able to experience. And that's definitely a mark of good game design right there, when a player is having fun and knows that it's their own level of skill which is preventing them from progressing rather than the game itself. Albion was created and released by a German company known as Blue Byte Software in 1995, though the English translation didn't hit North America until 1996, and it's a one-player role-playing game. Now, right away, one of the more unusual aspects about this game is that, even though it runs 320 by 200 for the intro sequence, the rest of the game runs in a modified 360 by 240 256 color VGA mode. Now, by 1995, this wouldn't be a big deal for anyone with up-to-date hardware, but anyone on a cheap clone VGA card or using an older monitor may have run into issues trying to run this game for that reason alone. The audio support is much more generic and supports an insane number of audio devices, as it's handled through third-party drivers. As for its current release state, it's still commercial and readily available from the good old games website at www.gog.com as a digital download for $6. Physical copies on the other hand are very hard to source and while they're not impossible to find, they often get mixed in with other things as the name Albion is used in a lot of other games. Of the physical copies I did find, one was just the CD for $15 and one was the fully boxed German release for $45, so your mileage is definitely going to vary. Heck, there's even a completely unrelated MMO called Albion Online, also made in Germany, also taking on medieval aspects. So yeah, very tricky to find this game specifically without running into search results for other things. Oh boy, this is a big one. There is a massive amount of backstory to this game, and then the game itself follows a very long sequence of events and narratives, so summarizing this is going to be kind of hard. I'll still give it a shot though. Besides, there's a few oddities I want to point out about the story, so I kind of actually have to. 
The story begins by discussing the Oversea Drive, a technology accidentally discovered in 2227, which makes intergalactic spaceflight possible, but still incredibly expensive due to still having to use conventional spaceflight technologies for significant portions of the journey. Still, the multinational corporations of the world saw this as an opportunity to ease the growing demand for resources and began sending probes into space to try and find a planet suitable to exploit for mining purposes. Two years later, one of those corporations, known simply as DDT, finds such a planet. With the time ticking to capture exclusive mining rights before other corporations get wind of the discovery, DDT makes contact with one of their spaceships known as the Toronto, a very large purpose-built craft designed to touch down on a planet and convert itself into a mining station. Their task would be to use the Oversea Drive to jump to the planet, have a smaller shuttle land and investigate the planetary conditions to confirm that they're suitable for mining, and if so, land the Toronto itself and begin the mining process. The main story of the game centers around two people from the Toronto, pilot Tom Driscoll and government scientist Rainer Hofstede. The game opens on a dream sequence Tom is experiencing prior to his shuttle flight to confirm the status of the planet that they've discovered. And when he wakes up, he finds out that the person he was supposed to shuttle down with, Inspector Jonathan Beagle, who was also a government representative, made a critical mistake with some communications equipment, which subsequently overloaded and blasted him into a gory mess. Now, this is one part of the story I find very bizarre, is that Tom's reaction to this event seems to show that he doesn't really care that somebody just died, and then not much later he's actually sort of excited to try and see the mess for himself, despite the room being cordoned off by security guards. Now, there's weird moments like this with everyone's dialogue where they feel slightly out of character, and I'm willing to bet it's more the fault of the English translation than the original German dialogue. Anyways, as a result of the explosion, Tom ends up partnered with Rainer instead, and when they proceed in the shuttle to the planet, their instruments go haywire, and they're forced to make a crash landing, following which they discover that the desert world they were expecting is actually overflowing with life. Then the shuttle explodes. So yeah, Rainer fortunately doesn't get injured too badly, but Tom ends up in a coma for nearly a month, and upon finally waking up, is greeted to this lovely image. Yes, I am censoring the hell out of this right now because alien boobs. Perfect for kids to adults, especially those six-year-olds. And seriously, this is the actual ESRB rating this game got despite the alien nudity. Now admittedly, as far as I'm aware, this is pretty much the only instance of blatant nudity anywhere in the game. But it's still really freaking weird to see this in a K to A game. In any case, after a couple months, Tom has recovered well enough to travel, and both he and Rainer have learned the language of the Eskai people, the ones who rescued and healed them after their shuttle exploded. It's from this point onward that the game properly begins. Now, even though I didn't get very far in this game, there is one thing I want to mention about the overarching story in that it's actually kind of easy to nitpick. Like for instance, the Toronto from the start of the game is a really freaking huge ship designed for interplanetary mining. So how does it even exist? The discovery of faster than light travel happened in 2227, but the Toronto was already out in space two years later when a viable mining target was discovered. We're talking about a spaceship bigger than your typical aircraft carrier, which by present estimates, it takes about four years to build one of those. So there's no way the Toronto could have been built after the overseas discovery, which means it had to have been built prior. But that just raises even more questions. Why build such a thing for a purpose you can't even fulfill without a particular technology, which is ultimately discovered by accident? And furthermore, where did the materials even come from? It's established in the story that Earth's resources are waning, so how were they able to cobble enough together to build something so ginormous before even knowing if they could actually put it to use? There's a couple other nitpicks I have as well for as little of the games I've seen, but because I don't speak German, it's not possible for me to compare the original script versus the translated scripts, so I don't know how much of this comes down to translation oversights or how much was actually from the original story. It's just something to be aware of is that for how well the story flows and for how much detail there is, it could have used some better scrutiny, at least on the English side of things.
Now, even though I didn't get very far in this game, I did get to experience quite a bit of the mechanics. Now, this is definitely an RPG, first and foremost, inspired by the original 3D CRPGs, given the way the control scheme works. You can actually play this game entirely with the mouse, without ever touching the keyboard. But suffice to say, using the keyboard for movement, at the very least, does make things considerably easier. Now, the first major thing I should point out about the gameplay is that there's not one, not two, but four distinct modes of play. Standard 2D exploration, 3D exploration, overworld exploration, and combat. Now, I'll go over each of these in more detail, but no matter which mode you're in, the mouse behaves the exact same way for all of them. You use the left mouse button for movement and selecting things in the menus, while the right mouse button is used to interact with people and objects in the world and perform context selections. Now, this is kind of weird how this works and can take a little to get used to, seeing as you hold the right mouse button down first to highlight what you want to interact with, and then you release the button to bring up a context menu for what you have highlighted. You do get used to this fairly quickly, though it's very weird that no matter what you highlight, there's always an option to go back to the main menu, which thankfully does not end the game in progress, so if you accidentally select that, you can just go right back to where you were. The game starts you in the standard 2D exploration mode. Now about half of the game plays this way, and it's used primarily for exploring non-dangerous locations, such as the Toronto, Alien Cities, Void Space, which wasn't blocked off for some mysterious reason. Also, if you choose to try and break into the comm room at the start of the game, you'll immediately get a taste of the 3D exploration, which makes up a solid chunk of the rest of the game, and is primarily used for hostile locations. Now, the 3D exploration takes a lot of getting used to due to the very limited field of view and the lack of a compass. Now, you can purchase a compass once you're on the planet, and believe me, it's very easy to lose your bearings without one. Now, the 3D sections also tend to be where you'll experience most of the game's puzzles. Now on the Toronto, when you break into the comm room, you find a gun and some ammunition for it. Highly illegal stuff in this game world, but you can't go back the way you came because it gets blocked off. Now if you leave the room with the gun or ammo in hand, it's confiscated by the guards. So what you have to do is backtrack to a storage locker which can be accessed from either side of the path that you went through, put the gun and ammo in there, go back to the comm room and leave past the guards, then go back through the path you originally used to break in, but only go so far as the locker, then pull the gun and ammo out, and there you go, eight shots of a really powerful long-ranged weapon early on. Sounds great, but you won't find more ammo until much later, and you're going to be engaging in a lot of combat. So those eight rounds aren't really going to help much in the grand scheme of things. Between the main 2D and 3D sections, you also have overworld exploration, which takes place at much more zoomed out angle, but otherwise functions much the same as the main 2D sections. I should point out by now that the game is actually keeping track of time, and some of the events in the game are linked to having a minimum number of days passing first. Though, as far as I'm aware, due to the linear nature of the story, it's not possible to miss events. As in, if an event is scheduled to occur, it'll either force you to go through with it the next time you transition between areas, or it's simply going to remind you that the event can now be done over and over until you ultimately go and do it. And this means that there's also a day and night cycle, which is handled fairly well and helps you to gauge time before you figure out how to get a clock going. Lastly, there's the combat. Now, although the combat looks very strategy based, it's actually more a mix between a typical strategy system and a typical JRPG system. Now, before each round of combat, you're able to assign actions to each party member based on their position on the battle grid, and they'll repeat certain actions like attacks every round until you tell them otherwise, or it's no longer possible to do so. I should point out too that between rounds of combat, you have full control over character equipment and items from the inventory screens, so you can easily swap out weapons, use potions, replace broken equipment, and all that jazz without incurring any penalties. When you start a round of combat, you watch it play out as turn order is determined by everyone's dexterity, and then a summary is shown of what happened. Since everyone has to select their actions prior to a round of combat being run, this means certain things you would never do in a grid-based combat system may actually be perfectly viable strategies here. For instance, if you have your characters run into the melee range of an attacker, well, since they're not already in melee range, the attacker's not able to strike them on that round because they can't be ordered to attack something which isn't in range. The combat system, though, does highlight one of the flaws of the game, and that's health. In any other CRPG, you would typically rest as your characters get injured to get your hit points back. 
But in this game, resting is always done in eight hour chunks, or until dawn, depending on what time it is. And once your characters are rested, they have to get tired again before they can rest again. This means if you fight a battle, rest, then fight another battle, you won't immediately be able to rest again, either forcing the use of potions or backtracking out back to a healer to get yourself healed. This cuts into the money you make very quickly, as many items in this game are very expensive, and you don't get money and experience very fast at all. So yeah, there's actually a lot of grinding in this game, at least as far as I can tell. Though I should point out, grinding isn't always possible. Maybe it was just the locations I had access to, but I found 3D locations spawn extremely few or possibly no random encounters at all, and that most encounters in the 3D sections seem to be preset. Now, the overworld, on the other hand, does have random spawns, but like some other RPGs, you can see all the action ahead of time, so if you don't want to fight something, you can just try to dodge around it. Actually, now would be a good time to go into the character stats themselves, as seeing as how this is an RPG, you'd expect a stat system of some kind, and many RPGs have similar conventions. But in this game, the stats are quite a bit different, so I wanted to quickly go over how they work. The first major thing you'll notice is that every character has maximum stats, so their various stats are only allowed to get up to that maximum, and then they won't go any higher. There's actually a particular mechanic in the game for increasing stats, which I almost got far enough to get into, but stopped short of reaching, so I don't know exactly how it works. As for the stats themselves, the first six seem fairly straightforward. Strength, Intelligence, Dexterity, Speed, Stamina, and Luck. Strength affects all forms of damage, as well as carrying limits. Intelligence affects how quickly skill stats will improve on their own accord. Dexterity solely affects dodging traps and attacks in combat. Speed affects how many grid spaces can be moved per round of combat, as well as turn order. Stamina affects damage resistance, as well as natural healing rates. And luck simply affects how often bad random events will occur on a character, such as triggering a trap. The next two stats are Magic Resistance and Magic Talent. The resistance affects how easily a character is harmed by magic, whereas talent affects how powerful the character's own magical attacks are. The last four stats are referred to as skill stats instead of attributes, because you can pay to improve these, and they can also fluctuate based on the equipment you have. Now these skills are close range attacks, long range attacks, critical hits, and lock picking, which as you might imagine, all determine how successful these skills are to use. Now you also need spare training points to improve skills, which you earn when you level up, along with more health and more spell points for magic users. There's only a couple more things I want to touch on with the gameplay, such as the conversation system. When you engage in a conversation with key characters, you get more than just a small bit of dialogue. You actually open up an entire system for discussing topics or getting information about particular items you have. Now, while the system is neat in theory and works well for topics, I find it doesn't work so well when it comes to items, as you find lots of items in the world which you'd love to know more lore about, but no one ever says anything about them. And such as when I buy this rope from the general store and I'm wondering what I use it for. So I ask the store owner about it, who then says, I am not interested in this item. So then why did you charge me three pieces of gold for it? Well, I'm on to you. The last thing to mention is that the game has a leader mechanic to help simplify some of the interactions. You can tell who in your party is the leader as their health bar is going to have a white outline around it, and you can select a different leader simply by clicking on that party member. Now, this is pertinent because whenever you interact with anyone or anything in the world, the leader is the one who does so. This means if the leader doesn't know the language of someone, communication's not going to be possible. Or the leader may be able to communicate better or worse, or may elicit a different response than other people in your party would. Also, some interactions are targeted based on who's in the lead. So for instance, when you want to train someone's skills, the skill trainer will always look to train whoever's in the lead, as opposed to asking who in your party you wish to train. Overall, Albion is fun, expansive, and gorgeous, but it's also got a very steep barrier to entry, and I think that's the ultimate hurdle which stopped this game from being as well known as other similar classics like Daggerfall and Ultima Underworld, since those games have a very straightforward premise and take place entirely in their 3D engines, you know what to expect and can readily adapt to the playstyle, mechanics, and controls. 
Here in Albion, you have multiple different systems to manipulate and learn, along with non-standard stats and interactions which take a bit of getting used to. This doesn't make the game bad by any means, just difficult to learn, which means it's more likely a player will lose interest before the game finally clicks with them and they start making actual progress. A more modern example of this are the Monster Hunter games, which are notoriously difficult to get into, but are considered amazing games by those who do get into them. With the latest game in the series, Monster Hunter World, being designed to ease down that barrier to entry as much as possible without sacrificing the core game mechanics. Basically, in the case of Albion, it's absolutely worth trying if you have any interest at all in RPGs or sci-fi stories, but at the same time, it's definitely not for everyone due to its complexities, and it can take quite a number of hours of gameplay to make that determination. So don't be surprised if you enjoy the game at first, and then never want to have anything to do with it ever again after a dozen hours despite having made it only about 5% through the storyline, which describes my experience exactly. As for DOSBox settings, you can set cycles to max, but certain non-critical aspects of the game will feel unnaturally fast this way. Ironically, this is the default configuration with the GOG release. I was playing with a cycles count of 50,000, which does drop the frame rate of the 3D sections, but leads to a more balanced experience overall. But you can adjust that number to taste, depending on how you want the experience to go for yourself. Anywho, that's all for today's episode of Ancient DOS Games. Sorry for having to push everything back a week this month, but we'll definitely move on to episode 232 next Saturday, and we're going to be taking a look at a sequel to one of the games that I've already covered on ADG, which plays almost exactly the same as its predecessor, but with some minor changes which make it different enough to warrant a full episode. So if you think you know which game that might be, then be sure to send your guest to ADG at Pixelships.com. And make sure to stay tuned because I actually do have the box and manual for this one too. Thanks for watching everyone, and special thanks to everyone supporting me on Patreon. Here's a small random set of you guys.